Okay, so a couple things. So the, uh, about the test. So the test is, it's in two parts. Tomorrow we're gonna do, you're gonna start with the multiple choice part, which is like the part that we practiced the last couple days, right? Okay, and I think it's, I've heard two numbers. I've heard 34 and 40 questions. I'm not sure which one, but either way, you got, you're gonna be there from 8 a.m. to noon. Uh, working on this. Yeah. So it's, I, I honestly don't think you're going to have any problem finishing up part one. You, but don't rush. I mean, if you need more time, that's fine. Okay, even if you do finish up part one, which I think that you will, then there's, you have the opportunity to do part two. Part two is going to be the performance task part, and that's what we're going to review today. It's kind of, it's uh, sort of like, multi, like a multi-part question where you have to explain what your thinking is, right? It's not just an answer. There's more to it than that. Uh, it's probably the easier of the two parts, although neither one of them is going to be terrible. Um, here's what I recommend. What I'm going to do and what I'm going to recommend everybody does tomorrow when we're administering the test. Once we get going on, on part one, after everybody's signed in, I'm actually going to start up a new test session for part two. People that finish have the opportunity of starting on that test session. Now, here's, here's what I want you to do, regardless of what how they do this. You should have this opportunity in your, in your testing session. There is, I asked a lot of questions today about this. There are no penalties for starting the performance task early. You can continue, nothing is invisible to you the next day. Everything that you look at the first day, why don't you scoot up a little bit, Brad? Uh, everything is visible to you the second day that you saw the first day, right? If you really feel like you want to just Plow on through this. Like you, you're on a roll. You, the first part was easy. And you want to just keep going. That's fine. But if you feel like you've, you know, you've had a lot of math today, you know, and you want to kind of take it easy and let your brain relax, that's fine. I, I can totally understand that. That's probably going to be the case. I would think. Then even then, I still think you should start the performance task. And here's why: the, the way that your brain works. You know, it's. I just just read a big book about. So this is just exactly what it was talking about. Uh, human ingenuity, you know, aha moments or moments of genius almost never happen when you want them to. They almost never happen when you're actually working on the task. They almost always, I mean, the vast, vast majority of the time, they happen when you're doing something completely unconnected, when you've allowed your brain to relax and kind of let go of the problem for a while. And so what I think you ought to do, even if you finish part one, in my opinion, you should open up the performance task and just read through it. Just read through it and kind of see what it's asking you to think about it a little bit and then put it away and let it go. And even though you're not going to consciously probably think about it the rest of the day, your brain will. I mean, how many times have you tried to remember something and you say, God, I just can't think of it. And as soon as you start, you forget about it, start doing something else, oh, I remember what it was. You know, it just pops in your head, right? Your brain just does that. That's just literally the way your brain communicates with itself. So even though you may not be consciously doing anything, thinking about this problem, your brain will. Your brain will be working on the task and it'll actually be activating some parts that will be useful to you the next day when you want to retrieve that information. You're likely, even though you probably won't remember, you're likely, when you sleep, your brain's likely to probably focus on that a little bit too. So, uh, so I, I recommend you do that, okay? Um, so when do we have lunch? Right after, right after you're done with SBAC testing, you'll get lunch. And then you'll go back. You'll get you know you'll go back afterwards. So it's like the first four periods. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Yes. I think you probably could, but I wouldn't really try unless you're really feeling like it's you're okay. You know that's okay to do. Because I don't want to like. Okay. On Wednesday, I don't want to check on my work. But you worried about missing classes? Well, I have a cadaver lab on Wednesday. Oh. Like the first that's fine though. You, okay, that's fine. You can still do that. You can still do the cadaver lab, and just and they'll just call you in some other time. Yeah, don't don't make. There's just so you know, there is a state law which everybody will be honoring here. You cannot. It's you can't penalize somebody for being gone for a state test. So everybody's going to either not do any. Like I'm not going to do anything in my classes while this stuff's going on. And anybody that has to go back and, and, and take care of this later on, like after Tuesday and Wednesday, I'll either just excuse them from the assignments or, you know, we'll work something out. But it's, 
it's totally worth it to every teacher. I mean, this is everybody that knows what this is about knows this is important to you guys and is going to totally support you doing this, just like they would SATs or ACTs. So don't don't let anything that's going on in school that you have to be there for. Like if you're going to the music thing on Wednesday, that's fine, go to it. That you need to, but don't let that impact what you do on Tuesday. You can always go back and finish it later. Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay, so, so let's have a look at this then. So the first one, and these are, by the way, these are the ones online under uh, SBAC prep. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to tell us what you're uh, I will. Remind me again if I forget, but I've got a list I'll put up here so you can see. Okay, it's just by last name is all. So let, let's have a look at this. Now, here's the situation. Lights, candles, action. So your friend Abby is making a movie. She's filming a fancy, fancy dinner scene. How about that? She has two types of candles on the table. She wants to determine how long the candles will last. She takes a picture, lights the candles, and then lets them burn for one hour. She then takes a second picture. You can assume that each candle burns at its own constant rate. So here's the information we've got. Here's the first picture at time zero, right? The initial, you know, when we, before she even lights the candles. Here's the second picture after they've burned for one hour. More importantly, they give you the data, maybe, that, that sort of quantifies this. So candle type A, initial height equals 20 centimeters. Now, what does initial height mean? That's an important phrase there. Starting height. Starting height. Initial just means beginning or starting, right? So we get the starting height uh, is 20 centimeters. Candle type B, the initial height or the starting height is 20 centimeters. OK, so. Candle type A height after burning for one hour is 16 centimeters. Now, what's that telling us that's important? Every hour, four centimeters. Okay, so four centimeters, Maisie, what are you going to say? Every hour? It burns 16 centimeters. It, no, it burns. Well, yeah. It burns how many? Four. Okay, four. It burns four. Okay, good. So it's burning four centimeters every hour. So we might call, what, what could we call that quantity? Rate of change rate of change or burn rate or something like that, right? And if we want to put a, a sign on that, if I wanted to say that the rate of change, is the rate of change positive four? It'd actually be negative four, wouldn't it? Because it's going down by four. And then for the other candle, after one hour, it's at nine centimeters. So its rate of change would be, or burn rate would be negative one, okay? So you will use this information to help Abby think about the candle she might use for her film. All right. So, okay, so let's go to part one here. Uh, candles A and B are lit at the same time. What will be the height in centimeters of each candle after three hours of burning? Okay, so, so how, how could we do this? Now, what might be a way to organize? And by the way, on this, this answer, you're just, you're just typing answers in. They're not asking for an explanation here, but we still want to get it right. So how could we, what are some ways that you could find out what those answers are? Okay, so you're losing three times four or 12 centimeters, right? So you could turn this into an equation, that'd be fine, right? You could do that. What else could you do here? Yeah, this is kind of what I'd almost recommend. Whenever you can on these kinds of problems, I would recommend making a table, right? So what would that table look like? If we're gonna make a table, it might be something like this. We might say uh, candle A height in centimeters and candle B height in centimeters, right? And then we've got time in hours. Does that make sense? And so then we've got zero is going to be the initial, right? And then one, two, three, four, five, and so on, right? So let's 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 take a good look at this because even though even though this part right here is just what you're doing on your paper, later on you're going to have to do some descriptions that are going to be the same thing, right? This table is going to end up coming in handy. You're going to use this a lot on a lot of these questions. So. Candle A starts at 20, candle B starts at 10. This one goes down by four, so next it would be what? 16, 16 then, well, then, then, and then, okay, then zero, okay. Uh, this one's just losing one every time, right? So it's nine, eight, seven, six, 
five, and so on. So after three hours, what's the height of candle A? Eight. Eight. Candle B? Seven. Seven. Okay. So that's all we're looking for for, for part one. Now let's look at not just what the answer is, but let's look at why it's graded the way it is by the actual people that grade. These are actual some sample responses. And let's see why they scored what they did. So here's the rubric. This is a one point or nothing question. You get one point for providing both correct answers. Candle type A will be eight centimeters and candle type B will be seven centimeters. Any other response is worth zero. You gotta get them both right, okay? Okay, but moving on to part two. Question two, this is a little different. Now this one, we're gonna have to do a little more explanation. And, and here's my recommendation. Whenever you're doing these performance tasks, Always pretend, you know like when in writing you always want to find your voice, like who you're writing for, right? Same kind of thing here. Imagine that you're doing this work, that you're trying to explain this to your younger sister or brother, or younger cousin or something, right? That's, that's younger than you are, they don't know as much math, and so you have to kind of over explain things, right? Uh, candles of each type were lit at the same time. Abby thinks that since candle type A burns more quickly than candle type B, that it will burn out first. So that's her thinking, right? Julie thinks that since candle type B starts out much shorter, it's gonna burn out first. That's her thinking, okay? Which candle will burn out first? So there's, you got, here are the questions you're gonna answer. Which candle will burn out first? Well, that's just a, a factual answer, right? But they don't stop there. It says, give a mathematical explanation to convince Abby and Julie of your solution. This is important. Make sure you read this stuff carefully. Clearly, clearly identify the quantities involved, okay? So what are the quantities involved in making that decision? Uh, Julie, th or uh, Abby thinks it's, it's all about how fast they're burning. So what would we call that again? The rate at which they're burning? Burn rate or rate of change or something, right? So that's one quantity we gotta talk about. Julie thinks that it's how they how big they were when they started out. What do we call that? Initial. Say it again? Initial height. Initial height or starting height or something like that. That's the other quantity we have to discuss because each one of them kind of oversimplified this, right? And that's the way these questions are going to be structured. They're, when they say this person thought this and this person thought this, typically they're only looking at part of the, they're not, they're not seeing the big picture here. Instead of just focusing on one or, or the other of those quantities, we have to use both of them in coming to our conclusion, right? Okay, so what do we do then? So to get full credit on this, the student correctly determines that candle type A will burn out first and provides a valid mathematical explanation that includes the initial heights and the burn rates, right? Because they want us to include both those quantities. Okay, so um, note here it says the students are not technically required to calculate the burnout times. You don't have to, but if you do, it's fine, right? One point would be the student correctly determines candle type A will burn out first, but doesn't provide a valid mathematical explanation. So they're not linking the math to their answer, right? Okay, so here are, here are some sample responses. Whoops. So this one looks pretty good. Right. This is this is a two pointer. So they got both two out of two points on this. I don't know. There's a few typos here. They don't really need those quotation marks. Right. That's not important. So Abby is correct because candle A looks taller, but it burns at a rate of four centimeters per hour, where candle B looks shorter uh, and burns at a rate of one centimeter per second. Since candle A is 20 centimeters tall, it will burn out in five hours, where candle B would take 10 hours. Okay. That's correct because she correctly identified that candle A is the one that's going to burn out first, right? And she also used both the initial heights and the burn rates to compute and compare the burnout times, right? So how could you do that? To me, the best way would have been that, right? Would have been that table to say, okay, this is, here's the initial heights, but with a burn rate of four centimeters per second. And you probably, when you're inputting this on the computer, you may not be able to make a fancy table, but that's all right. Just describe it. Just describe what the table would say. You could say, for example, something like this. For uh, If we look at the heights of, of candle A after each hour, 
they would be, after no time, it'd be 20. After one hour, it would have burned to 16. After two hours, it would have burned to 12, et cetera, right? And you can say why that is, because the initial value is 20 and the burn rate is four centimeters per hour, right? You can say the same stuff about candle B. Its initial height is 10 and its burn rate is one centimeter per hour. And so after one hour, it's nine, two hours, it's eight, et cetera, right? You could go down and just say that. And then you could see, based on this table, that after five hours, candle A has reached zero height, so it's burned out, whereas candle B is still five centimeters tall, right? Something like that would be, you've covered all your bases, right? Better to write too much rather than too little. They're not gonna penalize you for writing too much, but they are gonna penalize you for not writing enough. Does that make sense? I think the tables are your friend on this. So look, like, look at this example here. This sounds pretty good, honestly. <clears throat> candle A will burn out first because <clears throat> candle A burns four centimeters each hour, while candle B burns one centimeter each hour. Candle A will burn out while candle B still has five centimeters left. Well, obviously, this person knew what they were doing. I mean, they obviously had done some calculations here because they knew how much was going to be left on candle B, but it's not good enough because they didn't give any indication of how the information was derived. They didn't connect... <clears throat> they didn't connect what they did here to both the initial height and the burn rate. Does that make sense? So that sounds pretty good, but you still got to connect it to both of those quantities, right? And the table does that. And then this was also worth only one point because they once again didn't mention the initial heights. Okay, questions so far? All right. Okay, next one. Um, part three. It's these are graded by hand, so it won't. In fact, I don't think it's going to give you a score even on the first part, even the part that's multiple choice. I don't think you're going to see a score tomorrow, right? But it, it'll. I don't think it's going to take that long. I think it'll. We'll have a score. I'm hoping before the end of the year, but I'm pretty sure it'll be well before the end of the year. Okay. Last year, I think we had them. We had them pretty early, I think, last year. Okay. All right. So how about this? Abby has. Three hours left to film. She lights a new candle type A and candle type B and then starts filming. In the three hours she has left, will Abby capture the moment when the candles are exactly the same height? So they're asking you a yes or no question, but then also you have to explain to Abby how you can determine the answer, right? So how could we do this? What do you think would be a good way to do this one? The graph. The, yeah, the, I mean, the, or the table you mean, right? Yeah, the table. We could just go back to the table and we could say, I mean, it's all right there in the table, right? After three hours, after three hours, it's right there, right? So she's she's not going to see, isn't this what were they asking about if she sees the time when they're the same height, right? Uh, I've done this so many times today. So... Uh, after three hours, yeah, she doesn't, does she? Because candle A is still taller than candle B after three hours, right? After four hours, candle A has passed by candle B. So somewhere between three and four, right, it happens. But she only films for three hours, so she doesn't see it, right? Does that make sense? The table tells you that. Uh, what else could you do? Well, I mean, technically you could if you wanted to. You could make this into a linear system and solve, you know, make two equations and solve the system, and that's fine. You could do that, but that's, you know, if you want to, but you don't need to. You can just use that table. So what's the rubric? You get two points if the student correctly answers no, she's not going to see when the candles capture the moment when they're the same height during the three hours of filming, and she and supports the claim with a mathematically valid argument. So notice they even say here, this is like the note for the graders. This is what the graders would be using to grade these things. The underlying content is about systems of linear equations. However, students are not required to set up symbolically a system of linear equations in order to solve the problem. You could, right? You could, but you don't have to. So they don't even give us a two-point solution here. They'll, they only give us partial credit points. One point, student correctly, oh, hang on, never mind. Here's, like, here's some sample answers. Like, look at this one. This is only one out of two, right? And this is pretty good. She, they actually kind of did the table that we were talking about, right? Almost. Look what they did here. They said one times negative four is negative four, two times negative four is negative eight, et cetera. So they're really just finding for one, two, and three hours 
how far candle A is burned, right? And then down below that, they're actually telling us what are the heights of candle A after one, two, and three hours, right? Same thing over here for candle B. You get the heights for one, two, and three hours for candle B. And then based on that, they conclude, no, Abby will not see the two candles at the same height during the three hours that she's filming. What didn't they probably do here? They, well, they didn't have to. All they had to say was no and explain it. But once again, remember, you're trying to explain this to somebody younger than you. Are they going to look up here and see this stuff and be able to understand what that means? No, no. There needed to be some explanation of what all this stuff meant, right? What did these numbers, these quantities and equations actually mean, right? So this response is almost a two. In order to move from a one to a two, though, the student would need to be more explicit about the meaning of the numbers and calculations and then connect connect the two, right? Connect their answer to what was going on here. So all you would have had to have said is, after one hour, the height of candle A is 16 centimeters. You know, put this calculation up there. After two hours, the height would be 12. After three hours, it would be eight. And then same thing for candle B, right? Like you could have just added that above here in the text. And then it would have been fine, right? Does that make sense? Okay, and then the last part, The last part here is this part. Do they just set these down here? Mm -hmm. All right, so Uh, you have decided to use functions to help Abby think about the candles. You show her how to represent the height of a candle H as a function of time t using this equation, H equals k plus nt, right? First, explain to Abby what k and n represent in order to model the different candles. Be specific in your explanation. So that's what this part is asking you to do, right? You're just supposed to explain, if you take this model, H equals k plus nt, you got to explain to her what do the K and the N represent. Well, what do they represent? For candle A, what should the value of K be? Remember, and, and if you need to go back and think about this, H is the height and T is the time in hours. Right? So what would K be then? It'd be the initial height, wouldn't it? Right? Because the slope, the, the rate has to be what's being multiplied by the input variable t, right? What we're going to be able to do with this is we're going to be able to, for any time in hours, for any value of t, we should be able to input that and determine what the height is, right? So when t is zero, and, and here's a good way to remember this when t is zero, that's going to be the initial value, isn't it? Right? When t is zero, H should have its value of 20, for example, for candle A. Well, how's it going to do that? If T is 0, H just equals K, so K must be the initial height, right? Does that make sense? Now, you got lots of time to think about this stuff, right? Uh, then what's N going to be? That's going to be, well, T is time. What's N going to be? Like, we would know that when T is 1, from our table, we should get 16 for H, right? So 20 plus what times 1 should give us 16? What's that going to have to be? N. The rate of change. The rate of change. Yeah, it's going to have to be negative 4, isn't it, for candle A, right? Everybody see that? Because when T is 1, that's going to subtract 4. When T is 2, it would subtract 8. When T is 3, it would subtract 12, and so on. Right? And that's what the table does. Right? And here's once again where I think that table is useful to you. You can look at this table and say, all right, well, these are the values of t. These are the answers I'm supposed to get for h. Right? And so just double check as you go along. How am I going to get those in that equation? Right? For candle B, for candle B, we know that when t is 0, it's got equal 10. So k is 0. I mean, k is 10, right? After t is 2, it's supposed to equal 9, so n must be negative 1. Right? That's the rate of change, or the burn rate. Okay? 
Does that make sense? Okay, so two points. What do we have to do? The student correctly identifies that K represents the initial height of the candle and N represents the burn rate of the candle. Right? That's it. That's all you got to say. You don't put any numbers in there or anything. You're just explaining that. One point, you get one of them right, but not the other. Zero, you get none of them right. Okay, last one. Last one. All right, number five. Number five. Hey, guys. Don't, you're distracting them. But either go to the library or go back there or something. These, they have to watch this. Now choose either candle A or candle B to create an equation that will tell Abby the height of the candle t hours after it's lit. So all you got to do here, read these, read these carefully. Does it say both? No, it says either A or B. Pick whichever one you think is easiest. Choose either candle A or candle B to create an equation that will tell Abby the height. So all you're going to do now is go back up to this equation. Whoops. That equation and just plug in the values of k and n, right? So if we pick candle A, we're just going to get h equals 20 plus negative 4t or 20 minus 4t, same thing, right? If we pick candle B, we're going to get h equals 10 plus negative 1t or k minus t. If you want to just say it that way, right? Okay, does that make sense? That's it. That's not so bad. And notice that's all they want is an equation there, okay? Either one. Questions? It's not so bad, is it? The math on this part is not a big deal. It's really not. It's just that you got to make sure you're explaining everything you do. Okay. But you got lots of time. Take your time. Remember, this is worth something to you. I mean, it's worth something to you because the test is could be worth lots of money to you, right? In terms of scholarships and applications to college and things like that. But it's even worth something to you in this class, right? So, I mean, I'm going to make it worth your while if you pass. All right, so there's one. Let's take a real quick look how much time we got. Five minutes. Let's take a very quick look. We're not going to get to go through much of it, but let's just look at one more of these guys. Okay, so here's another one. So what's this doing? I wanted to show you a couple things here. I mean, it's, and we're not going to get through the whole thing. Not a big deal. I just want you to see another kind of format, right? Some things you could do here. So New York State wants to change its system for assigning speeding fines to drivers. The current system allows the judge to assign a fine that is within the ranges shown in Table 1. So if you're 1 to 10 miles over the speed limit, then the judge could be anywhere between $45 and 150 if you're 31 or more miles over, you could be anywhere from 180 to 600, just arbitrarily, based on how the judge is feeling that day, I guess, right? So some people have complained that the New York speeding fine system is not fair. Well, it doesn't seem very fair. There's a huge variation there, and it's all just based on what the judge thinks. The New Drivers Association recommended a new speeding fine system based on Massachusetts. Well, here's what Massachusetts is. One to 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, it's a flat $100 fee. 11 or more, then it's it's that flat fee plus $10 for each mile per hour over 10, right? Uh, so you got to analyze it, uh, both of those, and propose a fairer system, right? Which see which one's fairer. All right. So part A, all they're looking for here is they want. I just want you to see kind of what this tool does. You're going to sometimes be able to use these little tools on the test. So it says use the information in Table Two to plot data points for Massachusetts speeding fines. Plot a point to represent the fine for driving five miles per hour over the speed limit. So five miles per hour is hundred dollars, right? Plot additional points for each increment of five miles per hour over the speed limit up to forty-five. So full credit on this one means you just do that, right? You're just going to put a dot at at uh, m equals five, f equals hundred. M equals 10, F equals, M is just the miles per hour over the speed limit, right? Kind of like X. And F is like Y. Uh, you put in 5, get out 100. Put in 10, get out 100. 15 miles per hour over, now we get 100 plus. Every mile per hour over, we go up 10. So if I'm 5 miles per hour over, I'm going to go 50. So now I'm at 150. And then I'm at 200, etc. right? No big deal. The next one's going to ask you to write the equation. Uh, that goes with the fines when M is between 0 and 
and uh, 10, right? And so that's just going to be f equals 100. It's just a straight horizontal line, right? f is like y, so it's y equals 100. Then it wants you to write an equation for this part. Okay, well, we can do that a couple ways. And this is where we'll end up. Let's just look at one of these things here. So if we know that for speeds of 1 to 10, it's $100. For speeds of 11 or more, it's the $100 plus $10 per mile an hour over 10, right? So 11 is how many miles over 10? One. One. 13 is how many miles per hour over 10? Uh, how do you find out? Well, sub subtract 10, right? Okay, does it make sense then that we could do this? For, for values of 11 or more, the fine is going to be 100 plus m, which is the number of miles over the speed limit, miles per hour over the speed limit, minus 10 times 10, right? Let me do it this way. Ten times m minus ten. Does that make sense? That's one way you could do it, right? Hundred dollars plus ten dollars times whatever m is minus ten. Right? Thirteen minus ten would be three times ten is thirty plus a hundred is hundred and thirty. Okay. The other way you could do it though, just as good. Oops. Would be like this. What if we went down to this line right here? And we said, okay, this is, for values 11 and above, this is the line that describes the amount that you're paying, right? So we just want something like y equals mx plus b. But instead of y equals mx plus b, this is f and that's m. Okay, if I continue that line backwards, where does it cross? Where does it cross the y-axis? At the origin, at zero, right? So we know that m is 10, because that's the slope, and b is zero, right? So really what we end up getting is f equals 10 times m, like x, because that's the number of miles per hour over 10, plus zero. So that's the other thing we could say. Either f equals that or it equals that, right? You get the idea? You'll be fine. Just take a look at these tonight, maybe real briefly, and you're good.